I suppose that the, the beginnings of Jonathan Creek really were when we were when we were doing Monfort in the Grave when uh, Susie Belbin, who, who produced and directed Monfort in the Grave for most of its history, and I were ruminating on the idea of doing a, a what what we sort of termed a, a British Columbo, really, um, a, a detective series that was. Uh, more about the, the the puzzle and the and the clues and the mystery and the, and almost the sort of intellectual the pursuit of an intellectual solution than sort of uh, car chases and people kind of kicking down doors and everything but, and laced with you know, some some good characterization and uh, and and humor oh, what's this some dust on your face here let me get that for you Again. Ever. 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 Definitely. Understood. Well, I'd started reading impossible crime fiction, and these are the novels of people like John Dixon Carr and certain of the, the Father Brown stories by um, G.K. Chesterton, um, which revolved around people being found dead in locked rooms, sealed rooms that the murderer couldn't possibly have escaped from, um, which I, I found very exciting in a way. And um, at some point, I think I made the decision that, in addition to it being a detective series with, with all, of, all those other ingredients, um, that would be a nice kind of um, theme for it. Oh. <laughs> Nobody touch anything. was self-inflicted. No, he can't have. Look, perhaps it's best if you just... For God's sake! Jack didn't shoot him, so he couldn't have. He had crippling arthritis in both hands. Someone set this up. Mrs. Holiday, we're 30 feet underground. You saw yourself how those doors were bolted on the inside. It's a simple physical fact. Nobody could possibly have killed your husband and then left this room. I suppose, ultimately, the, the great thing of beginning to work on Jonathan Creek was really meeting David Renwick because I think he has influenced me in, in a big way in my approach to comedy, probably, in that he's got such a good comic eye and a sense of comedy. Pleased to meet you, Jonathan Creek. Madeline's a little shy because, uh, shall I tell him, the two of us are on a blind date. Get out of here. I placed an advertisement in one of those contact columns, Madeline replied, and here we are, testing the water as to her. To see if we want to get into bed together. Well, literally, I hasten to add. That's just a term we use in corporate management. Though speaking for myself, I have to say, one of Cupid's arrows has definitely found its mark. It's always difficult getting shows commissioned. I mean, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, what kind of success you've had. And One Foot in the Grave was riding very, very high at that point. But it never guarantees you an automatic uh, uh, commission or, or guarantee of production. Um, mainly because what I ended up writing was was expensive, really. I certainly had um, Caroline very much in mind as, as the Maddie McGillan character. Um, and uh, another actor as Creek who turned us down. They were really in trouble. You know, they'd been, they'd had 37 people in or something. And one day Susie came in and said, um, you know, I've just, just seen this, this guy, Alan Davis, um, workshopping a sitcom in some church hall somewhere. So she said, oh, we're doing a show, actually. David Renwick's written in her, cos I knew who he was. And um, she'd come in and meet him. And actually, and then I was at the British Comedy Awards. This was in 95, and I was nominated for stand-up. Me, Bob Monkhouse and Joe Brand. Joe Brand won. And she actually rang me the night before and said, by the way, I thought you might know I've won in case you don't want to bother going. So I said, no, I'm going to go. And, uh, and I, was talk I was talking to um, Bob Mortimer, and he was just about to introduce me to Ulrika Johnson, who was looking pretty hot on the night. And uh, Susie Berwin came over and said, would you like to meet David Renwick? And I was in this dilemma. <laughs> Ulrika, David, David, Ulrika. So I passed meeting Ulrika. <laughs> And um, he came in, had a meeting, came in wearing the duffel coat, which we sort of thought, well, you know, maybe we should keep that, maybe we should keep the long hair. 
which he had at that time. And, um, you know, th we, um, we did a, a little uh, mini screen test on video when uh, he and Caroline just read through the script across the table. Um, and I just remember putting that tape on and thinking, you know, yeah, this is the closest where anyone has got to this character, you know. And, you know, he wasn't really even trying at that point. And I was just sort of believing it. I wasn't seeing a performance anymore. I was just seeing a character. He was the character I'd written. Morning. You're useful to have around. This is illegal. I'm just curious to see how these are. Ah. I see what you're about. So how are things in the old investigative journalism department these days? Yeah, still learning a crust here and there. And Trevor? Trevor and I were getting on each other's nerves in the end, so I did the mature thing and set fire to his underpants. Listen, since we spoke, I've had a thought. How do you fancy a drive down to the coast today? Flush out the carbon monoxide with a bit of sea air? That's a tempting idea. And I'm going to have to put this back on once I've worked to have it. Unlock it. 42 seconds. Interesting. Yeah, I'm very impressed. It takes me that long sometimes for the tea. Yeah, I can imagine. I think it was Alan Yentel who was controlling BBC One, who wasn't too sure about me, because I hadn't been on BBC One. This was a big deal, this show. So uh, they had to do a, uh, we had to do a screen test where they basically they'd borrow and steal a little crew and some money. And, and we filmed in Susie's office and we filmed um, in the Blue Peter Garden. So I had to do a scene with Caroline with the bust of Petra the dog looking over her shoulder and the camera over the other shoulder. And I'd never really done the film stuff before, so it was all a bit of a novelty. A few more coordinates. We can start to join them together and see where all this is leading. I get nervous after I eat. That's a good combo. You never put them together as ice cream flavours. I remember it was actually Valentine's Day in 1996. They got a call on my mobile from Susan Bowie saying, we've persuaded them that you're, you're the one. So I was like... <laughs> Don't scrape that off. It's meant to be that colour. It's Cajun. Black and catfish. Looks more like halibut to me. Black and halibut, then. I had to improvise. You have less of the pedanticism and just eat. The word is pedantry. My first day on set, um, I turned. I didn't. I had no idea what was going to happen. First of all, I, I was. They said we're shooting in Kentish Town, and I'm thinking, how do I get to Kentish Town? And then a car comes and picks me up, so that was good. And I turned up, and I was at the unit base. I didn't know what a unit base was. I turned up, and there's no one around. I think, where is everyone? What's going on? And I was second day days there, and I said, what do you? It's always someone at the unit base who's looking after the board turns. You know. I said, where is everyone? He says, do you want to go to set? Looking at me as if I was mad, because they're shooting a scene that I wasn't in. And I said, yeah, I want to see everyone. So we went up to Primrose Hill and they were shooting in the Greek restaurant in Primrose Hill. And Susie Belbin would literally sit with me and say, that's the best boy, that's the gaffer, those are the prop boys, those people over there drinking tea and chatting, that's wardrobe and makeup. <laughs> that's Caroline Quentin. And uh, this is, and so I watched the scene. And then I waited around and then we had lunch and then I waited around and I waited around and I got, and I'd been there for 10 hours and they rapped and we all know. <laughs> hadn't been in anything. I hadn't done it a single shot. And, uh, Pete Robinson, who was the gaffer, came, spoke to me a few weeks later. He said, you remember that first day? I said, yeah. He said, you didn't do anything at all. He said, yeah. He said, I thought you were a lazy prop boy. He goes, he's just sitting about in those trousers and a check shirt, just chatting up the makeup girls. I thought you was just doing... I didn't know, I didn't know you were. I said, no, I'm Jonathan Creek. Well, Caroline and I knew one another, so that was really helpful to me, and she was very helpful, especially early on, with just keeping me relaxed. She remember one day she said to me, before I had a big speech to do and there was a camera move and there was a prop and there was a boom here and, and she could see I was w waiting for action like someone waiting for a gun at the start of a race. And she turns to me, she goes, just breathe out, breathe out now. <laughs> and I went, oh, that really works. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that before every take for about the first two years. Um, but she's very experienced and, and, and the part had been written by David for her. So. It was a, it was a good it was a good start in a way to have somebody on you. With Caroline, there was a, a different approach. He would arrive totally word perfect, and from eight o'clock in the morning, he'd be giving you 
full power, you know. Caroline would arrive, she's much more casual, you know, you think, oh my God, maybe she doesn't know her lines. And, but as she get into the scene, she would work her way up and then she would become brilliant. And um, of course, during the day, because Alan is working at such an intensity, he's, he's going all the time, all the time, all the time. So by the end of the day, he's getting very tired. Uh, Caroline is different because she sort of starts slow and builds up. By the end of the day, she's singing, you know, Aah! she wants to do more, more, more. So the, the kind of secret is to, with them, when they were working together, was to come to that point where they met in the middle when they were both on the song, you know. What am I being accused of here? That I led you on with inducements of sexual favours. Oh, no, you made that very clear right up front that you had no interest in me whatsoever. So how did I deceive you? By telling me, categorically, that you weren't interested in me in such a way that implied you were interested in me. <laughs> I don't have to listen to this. Once in a while, it wouldn't hurt you to stop putting on an act and be yourself. Oh, really? And it wouldn't hurt you once in a while not to be so infuriatingly, self-righteously, bloody honest! Hello? You can't begin to imagine the fetid quagmire that passes for my love life. It has no stability of any kind. All right, say I was enjoying your company. Well, stranger things have happened. Hello? And Caroline's sense of timing is fantastic. And she again, has this great ability to make you believe, believe in her. Also, she was kind of, I remember the thing, wonderful thing about Caroline is she was presented with awful things, like once we presented her with this huge octopus which she had to eat and enjoy, and she just went for it in the most wonderful way, so you really believed. I mean, maybe she did enjoy it, but she made you believe that she could enjoy eating this awful thing with all its feelers. She has a great sense of going, going for it, really, which, which is terrific. Morning. Oh. It's the bad penny again. <laughs> Actually, it's my day off, so um, I don't know how you're fixed. Oh, I bought you some underwear. Oh, Shelford. I think you'd better come in for a sec. Look, it's not that I don't find you attractive. Oh, good. No, that's not true. It is that I don't find you attractive. It's no reflection on you as a person. You're very warm and kind and generous. It's just that I can't find it in myself to want to spend another second of my life in your company. Do you understand? It could never work, not even as science fiction. You and me are a total no-no. Still, it's early days, isn't it? And from little acorns, mighty oaks to grow. Oh, God. And the other thing is, I'm already sleeping with Jonathan. Where have you been? You love rocket. Come here and give me your tongue. I'll um, see myself out then, shall I? If she knew what she was doing, she was very good, and I was really trying hard. <laughs> I had a fairly major rewrite on after the first episode, which introduced the illusionist for whom Creek uh, worked and, um, and featured a couple of his rather grand illusions on stage. There was quite a lot more of that in the subsequent episodes, uh, as, as written originally, which I had to trim out simply because, obviously, that was going to cost a lot of money and it wasn't wholly germane to the, to the, to the central plot. So... Um, which you know, I, I broke my heart at the time because I thought this is sort of, in a way emasculating the show. We're you know we're reducing that balance between the, the show business world and the comedy and the and the you know the the uh, murder investigation or whatever it was. Um, but as it happened, I think it probably all were fairly overwritten in the first place, and it was you know it was a fairly valuable streamlining process. I think. I remember David coming to my um, little changing room in this little caravan. And he said, "I don't want him to be a nerd. He's not a nerd." He's a hero. I want him to be a hero. He's not a. He's never going to be in a fist fight, and he's never going to run about and jump over car bonnets. But he's a. He comes in, and he's a hero figure. He's not a nerd. And the actual Bandawi bush cats, utterly amazing. Hang Carl speaker cabinets presented by the Gambian percussionist Josh Bandawi in. What year were you over there? 1973. I think you'll find it was 76, because tribal jam didn't hit the charts until early 77. We were in Zaire in 76. No. It was deported from Zaire in May 75, after Martin Crow rode into the president's jacuzzi on a wildebeest. 
Mad as a light bulb. Working with Ralph Brown on No, no Trace of Tracy was very nice because he, he was a very serious actor and played it very, very believably. And uh, so he brought a new feel to it. Sometimes some of the performers are more entertainment based and more comic based. But uh, usually the guest stars are playing absolutely straight and quite very intensely believable characters. Um, the essence of Jonathan Creek is about that, I think, is making the whole thing believable. But we mustn't confuse what's impossible with what's implausible. I've got lots of memories of working the first series. Uh, House of Monkeys, particularly, because we had uh, so many live monkeys and uh, we had a woman in a gorilla suit. It was amazing. It was the most beautiful animatronic thing with the eyes going and so that, that's the thing about Jonathan Creek you get into such intense detail with any of the stories oh sorry um, I didn't realise We had an episode called House of Monkeys where uh, Jonathan Creek is in bed with Maddie and you think they're going to get it together. And, uh, but he's actually, he's got a heart monitor on because he's a bit worried about his <laughs> heart rate. <laughs> so she kicks him out and uh, there was a nudity clause written in my contract because they wanted to see my bum as I went around the bed, which Caroline was a little bit overexcited about, I thought, frankly. <laughs> so kept trying to embarrass me and succeeding. But anyway, I come out and then he pulls his pyjamas on, or his pyjama bottoms on or something, and he goes out and there's a gorilla on the landing. So he gets chased down the landing by this gorilla and then falls down this huge staircase. So they send me off and they bring in the stunt man. So he's told he's got to fall down a huge wooden staircase wearing only a pair of pyjama bottoms. There's no padding, no. And he chucked himself down this thing. He was a really fit, muscly bloke, so I was quite pleased about that, doubling up. And then he goes, cuts to the bottom of the stairs and I'm just like... <laughs> Look out and the gorilla jumps at me. one instance working with Annette Crosby because I know David had watched a lot with her in the past and One Foot in the Grave but uh, she was uh, in House of Monkeys and uh, what I usually do on the hundredth take is uh, get champagne out you know when everyone has a glass of champagne so I did it at lunchtime this day when we were working with Annette you know I said oh this is great she had a few glasses of champagne we came after lunch we we're trying to do a scene with her and she was oh, she's saying I'm not working with that Sandy Johnson again he's got me drunk so that was I hope she will work with me again she's awfully nice I think we did get quite a lot of good press review on when the first one went out. Um, but, of course, I only remember the very bad ones, which is, uh, as I tend to do normally. I read sort of three good reviews and one bad one and get depressed by the bad ones. So those are the ones that stick in my mind. We knew we were onto something because they commissioned the second series whilst we were shooting the first one. So... And you could feel that. You fe felt OK. But no idea how it was going to turn out, really. I think... Uh, um, I was surprised when a couple of awards came through, and particularly there was one which was a whatever it is, the National Television Awards, which was a, supposedly a phone in you know, public vote in which we won. And um, I think that was the most surprising moment for me that I suddenly felt oh, there is a place in the public's affection for us. And then six months later, we're at the BAFTA, we won the BAFTA. And all I remember about that is the two directors and a producer were going to go up, and there are three BAFTA, and I'm sitting with them in the audience, and I kind of instinctively I said, and they got up to go past me, and, and uh, Marcus Mortimer goes, come up, come up with us. So I came up as well, and I'm stood on the stage, and they gave three BAFTAs out, and I'm on the end, there's no prize for me. <laughs> so I felt really stupid. So, and then they all knew what to do. They'd obviously won awards before. They shot off the back of the stage and out to have their photos taken, and then I was looking in the audience with David Renwick's wife, Ellie. <laughs> Walked off down the front, made a complete fool of myself. No one knows. <laughs>